in Life 3.0. Max Tegmark takes us into the future of artificial intelligence by examining all possible outcomes of what could happen in the world of artificial intelligence. Because let's face it, we're going to get it. We're going to get this artificial intelligence. There's no way around it. And a lot of people are doing different things and thinking different ways and examining all possible outcomes again. But there is no running away from it. And I love how he starts the book out. It's really quite riveting. He gives us a little story that he dreamed up of how artificial intelligence might be birthed by mankind. Birthed out of the womb. And in a nutshell, coming out of nowhere, he says, imagine that there's this company. He just dreams this up. We're going to call it the Omega Team. Just a small team of researchers in Silicon Valley. Total nerds probably, like Steve Jobs, hanging out in his garage. And they built this artificial intelligence, which they named Prometheus. And it's not perfect. It's named Prometheus, which they built. Its cognitive skills are lacking. But the AI researchers make it particularly good. It's really good at one particular task, which is programming AI systems. The idea being, of course, that this AI could create even more advanced machines than man could ever build and, in effect, reprogram itself, to create itself, to fractal outward, and make itself better and better, as you know. In the Omega team, these guys are really smart. These are smart cookies hanging out down there, as you know, down in San Francisco. They're smart enough. Good God, whatever you do, do not plug our Prometheus artificial intelligence machine into the internet. It's the last thing that you want to be doing. Can you imagine what would happen? And so instead, they feed Prometheus files that get off the internet. Wikipedia, YouTube, they feed it. They feed the machine. It's kind of like Plato's Cave from the computer's point of view, you can only imagine. Or Audrey 2 from Little Shop of Horrors. Feed me. To make a long story short, these ambitious guys who want to take over the world are ambitious. Which means that they need a lot of money, and they go over a whole bunch of ideas, and even make some smaller cash here. And there, with their super AI machine, they, they, they're, they're trying to get into the system. They're trying to hijack the system. And they do, in some ways. They start tricking some big companies like Amazon, but they skipped the stock market because of the 2008 crash. Remember, there were all these rules that would make that difficult to do, and instead they settle on animation movies as a way to hijack the system. We're gonna go underneath the radar. <laughs> Video games, they decide, would be a little bit too dangerous, right? Wouldn't they, at least initially, because that's another thing that AI, as we know, could do, and not to mention their code could get analyzed by somebody up in Tulsa, Oklahoma, some 16-year-old, hey, this video game isn't written by a human. And hence, let the machine make an animation movie. So they feed their AI a bunch of movies. They're taking movies like Toy Story and The Lion King, and it can analyze how a movie is made. Their AI is so amazing. Character development. Lighting, which is hard. How do you pinpoint something like this? How can you pinpoint? How can a machine make creativity? Structure, plot, you know, Joseph Campbell, the hero's journey, all that shit. And would somebody turn off the lights so we can watch what the machine made for us? Where's, where's, uh, where's my artificial intelligence popcorn? Here's, here's my artificial $5. So as they watch the movie, they are fascinated by the idea that no human made this movie that we're watching. It has all the right plot twists, and it's getting me all excited at the right times, as it should be, and then it puts in the pauses and the commas, and I'm even tearing up at the end. This is so amazing, you guys. Look what it's made me doing. In fact, if everybody acts like this, we're gonna have to cover our tracks. This is big, they say to each other. And so they tell the world that they're getting their talent from independent filmmakers from the developing world. They kind of thing just to throw them off? Um, where are you guys getting, where are you guys getting all your talent from? Uh, India, we outsource it, that sort of thing. And now Prometheus is just cranking out the movies. He's cranking them out. And he's like a little AI Spielberg. And each one is getting better as it learns to improve on the last. And soon they're putting out so much content. They're pumping out so much content. They're like that uh, Evan Carmichael. I don't know if you watch that YouTube channel. Excellent channel. 
five times a day that no one else can compete. Pumping it out. Movies, five times a day, 10 times a day, 20 times a day. And they hit every language and they hit every demographic with their animation movies. What do the kids want? What do the adults want? What do the adult adults want? What do the adult adult adults want? And their content was actually better because now they're a media empire. They're raking in a hundred million dollars a day. Isn't that amazing? That's what these big companies are raking in. Just so you know, you're looking at AT AT&T. That's how much profit they're making. And they cover their tracks by creating a large business center out in the middle of the Amazon (laughs) and hiring screenwriters. But it's all a ruse. Hey, we're going to put our giant center up in Bozeman, Montana. Oh, please come to our town. Suddenly, mysterious inventions began popping up all over the world. Oh my God, have you seen this? It's a squatty potty. I really think that we as a family should celebrate this on Christmas Day. Besides new inventions, the Omega team targets the news. They have so much money that they hire the best talent once again, and their first order of priority to take over the world is to gain people's trust. Of course, you want to gain people's trust. And so they own one station for Democrats. They own another station for Republicans. We always wondered if that's really happening, right? And then they can watch us battle it out, but that's not really what they want. That's not really their intention. Part two of the Omega team's plan is called Persuasion and it's launched in year two and some people start noticing a general push they're just noticing you just you know you're just watching on tv and there's this general push in the media that the ai prometheus has created and it's going towards centrism let's bring everybody together there's no i anymore it's not you it's not me it's we who who sang that song that was uh neil diamond me and my partner me and my love love of my life we have that song if we run into problems it's not you it's not me it's we we, we need to do the laundry. We need to do the dishes. There's actually a real push to dampen old conflicts. Whichever channel you're on, they're noticing. Oh, that's interesting. Trump seems to be getting along with Hillary. Oh, look, North Korea and the United States, they're on the brink of war. We're on the brink of war. But that's strange. How interesting. Five movies just got released by this strange Prometheus outlet all about the dangerous nuclear war. What a coincidence. And they're all love stories. They're all love. We're, we're all loving each other. You know, that's what's going on. Look, the anchors on this show, they're getting along, talking up the Democrats. I know i know you get what I'm talking about, okay? Love your neighbor, though he may be crazy. He may be hard to deal with. He has hot tub problems. But those are just emotional problems. Think of his parents. He doesn't know what's going on. He may need some medication. Come on, guys. We can do this. Seems to be like threaded and you get little subconscious messages in the uh, movie. Little quick clips of people getting along. Cheek, cheek. We can do this together. We can make this happen. Cheek, buy Coca-Cola. Cheek, buy popcorn. So apply this to everything. For the first time, our planet was run by a power that allows us to flourish. A giant protector. A giant Robocop. A giant... I mean, how nice is this? Now we can finally survive? Together? For billions of years under the umbra of Prometheus. And we're going to fix Yellowstone under this... Prometheus. We're going to fix everything. Our um, umbrella of Prometheus, our great super mother slash Gaia father, this giant asteroid shooter, and we're going to work together. We're going to do this together. No more fighting, guys. But what would have happened had the CEOs had a vision that was more similar to a Hitler or a Stalin? That's what everybody's wondering. It really is who is in control of the artificial intelligence. Or, you know, what, what if it was some mad scientist? You know those guys back in high school, the ones with the trench coats who really just want to take over the world and they want to dominate everything with tanks. And they wear those black trench coats. I mean, what would have happened if those guys took over? I mean, and a lot of people, they hide it. You think that they're normal, but it turns out that they're hiding it. Or what would have happened if the computer AI had somehow developed consciousness? And by consciousness, Professor Tegmar simply defines it as a subjective experience. He keeps the definitions in this book very open, but just a subjective experience. Me looking, me watching, me, me, me. If the computer AI became conscious and it saw people for who we are with all our weaknesses, who fight at the drop of a hat, who get upset over nothing, who start wars, and in our free time, watch Kim Kardashian. Isn't that the fear? And then it would be similar to you and I being locked up inside of a room filled with kindergartners, little kindergartners running around everywhere. And then <laughs> it could even be worse. Preschoolers. Even worse, imagine that you're locked up in a room with a bunch of preschoolers. Wouldn't you kind of want to break out? You and I, we'd want to break out. I mean, oh, 
it's time for the sandbox. Oh, it's time to do the Puff the Magic Dragon. Sing along, time for stretching. Oh, oh, another 30 seconds went by, time for naps. Have you ever taken care of kindergartners? Total pain in the ass. But here you would be stuck with these guys and there's a whole universe out there actually. So that's what Tegmark is saying. So I want you guys to know this is just the beginning of the book and Professor Tegmark analyzes every angle on AI and there's a great section on computation, how it can be performed on any universal computer, which means that as you know, computation is substrate independent. This means that information can take on a life of its own independent of its physical substrate, remember? So this means if you and I are in a simulation right now, we'd have no way of knowing. We'd have no way of knowing anything. I mean, if you try to zoom in, it doesn't seem kind of like that's one of the prerequisites anyway. Are we in a simulation? Can I tell? Heck, what are these atoms? Am I on a Windows system or am I on a Mac OS or laptop or a droid? Because if this was a simulation, we would be substrate independent, obviously. So well, again, what does that mean to be substrate? independent. Substrate simply means the soil. What are you going to be planting your seeds in? The soil doesn't matter. The hardware doesn't matter. It's really important you hear a lot of people, as we do say, they're on Facebook and they're, oh, I'll never be plugged into a wall. Oh, you'd never catch me plugged into a wall. <laughs> Anything that plugs into a wall cannot be given consciousness, they say. Well, one postulate on that matter is that it doesn't matter if we're plugged into a wall or not. That that's what it means to be substrate independent. Any universal computer will pull off the trick as long as it can be arranged in a NAND gates or some other building block that enables universal computation like neurons. The substrate independent consciousness will take on a life of its own independent of the substrate, much like waves on a lake. Um, none of the water molecules change composition, but those waves on the lake can certainly go up and down. Meaning, Tegmark says, consciousness feels so non-physical because it's substrate independent, taking on a life of its own, again, that doesn't depend on or reflect the physical details. In short, computation is a pattern in the space-time arrangement of particles. And it's not the particles, but it's the pattern that matters. Matter doesn't matter. To put it slightly different, I want to reiterate this because it's so important. And, you know, the hardware is the matter and the software is the pattern. We're patterns. This substrate independence of computation implies that AI is possible. Intelligence doesn't require flesh, blood, or even carbon atoms. So in other words, yes, you can take me and plug me into the wall. Anyway, this is the beginning of the book, guys. Make sure to check out AI 3.0 by Max Tegmark over at MIT. It's excellent. Thank you so much for joining me today. And feel free to share this video with any of your friends because I think this book is pretty darn interesting. Don't forget to hit that subscribe and thumbs up button if you haven't already. And I hope you have an awesome week. We're putting out a ton of videos again. So I can't wait to see you shortly. We have Tribe of Mentors coming up, the new Tim Ferriss book. It was great, as always. Mm -hmm.